I'm not going to spend a lot of time on an introduction. Let me just say that both of our speakers were former Launchpad Job Club members. And I think that you're already, if any of you have been feeling as though uh, you got laid off because you were the, the worst employees in the, you know, in the hierarchy, I think you can see we have got some talent here. I don't know how the city is even functioning with, with the brain power that's unemployed and in this room. But uh, both of these guys were Launchpad members years ago, and they are now both uh, directors with a cool staffing company called Liaison Resources that uh, they'll correct me if I'm wrong on this. They, <laughs> they find jobs temp and direct hire jobs for creative people, for writers, for web developers, designers, graphic people. Uh, they may do other folks, but that's how I've always um, uh, affiliated them with uh, or associated them with, with the creative side. And boy, are they creative. They're the only people that have ever brought milk and cookies. <laughs> milk and cookies because they're going to tell us some stories. All right. Uh, so Mark Cadell and Scott Hoover. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. So, if you didn't happen to um, read the invitation, what we're going to accomplish here is we're talking about stories. And that's why we brought cookies and milk. So, it would hopefully trigger that time <coughs> in your life where you said, Mom, Dad, tell me a story. You know? Because something about it triggers. My name is Mark Cadell, and um, many years ago, I sat in this chair. This chair? Yep. <laughs> yeah, that one. It's got a little bend to it. Yeah. <laughs> I put gum underneath it, too. <laughs> but I sat in this chair. And I was stressed out. I was nervous. And um, I was depressed. And, huh, all that. About a week before that, on Monday morning, I found out my wife was pregnant. Which was a pretty neat thing, right? And then on Wednesday, she lost her job. Wow, okay, well, okay. Thursday, my car, favorite car of all time, was sitting in the parking lot where I worked, and someone fell asleep on Breaker Lane and crossed mediums and crossed parking lots and somehow smashed my car. Totaled. <coughs> Gone. And she was okay, which I was very happy about. And then Friday, the CEO asked me into his office. And they didn't even know my wife was pregnant. Nobody really did. And I got laid off. <coughs> and I was like, okay, well, what's going to happen on Saturday? <laughs> <laughs> and it was a very very difficult time for me and my family and um, but I but I was lucky enough to find out about Launchpad Job Club and uh, came here and sat in these chairs and um, stayed open to the possibilities and little by little I met people I took advantage of what Kathy had to offer Back then, she had a big binder. She was just printing everything out, reading it to us. There was, I don't know, it, it wasn't, Indeed didn't even, it, when did Indeed start? What year? Oh, Indeed doesn't know. Uh, <laughs> but it might have been, it couldn't have been, God, 2003, 4, 5, something like that. But the, all that stuff wasn't there. This was here. So I started climbing my way back into what I could do. I, uh, I woke up at 2.30 in the morning to throw papers with my neighbor, who was an adult uh, that had a job, but she needed extra money, and she asked me if I would throw papers, and I made 30 or 40 bucks. And, um, and then by day, when I was awake, I would just keep looking, keep trying. 
And I went through so many things back then, and, and this was an important part. And I had to find myself again. I had to find out what was important to me and what was important to people out there and how I could hook up. So um, now I'm the Director of Operations at Liaison, celebrating my 10th year, and uh, have helped the company grow. Thank you. <laughs> That does not count as participation. Yeah, yeah. that does count, yeah. okay. I guess. Okay. Um, and I've, I've helped direct a 400% increase in our revenue. And um, now I don't say that to brag. I say that because I want to encourage you all that no matter how you feel at this moment, uh, with uh, keep coming to these meetings, keep networking, keep coming to all these resources, and take advantage of them because you do have a story and your story will unfold it will scott well if uh, mark's life was like a, a full feature film i'd be playing at the alamo draft house to uh, a packed crowd right yeah that's a pretty pretty <laughs> exciting story my life is probably more like something that would debut at the pflugerville film fest uh, <laughs> nothing wrong with pflugerville i live that's kind good. of in that area but can you hear uh, scott okay back there yeah. okay a little um, bit louder on here. Bring it up a little bit, testing. Because he's funny. I don't yeah. want you to miss this well, stuff. Well, that was all I have. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, same, same kind of story. I, I, I found myself here, uh, but I wasn't sitting next to Mark, but it was in 2008, and I had been working for a company for 24 and a half years. And it's like, oh, could I not hit the 25 mark, right? <laughs> um, but I, I was at first really kind of devastated by that, but then I, like, I reached back to when I first started for that company and what... What I realized was that I had moved to Austin in uh, 1982, and I did not have a job. And uh, I left my high school sweetheart um, up in Minnesota. And yes, I'm a Yankee, but I've been in Texas longer than I've been in Minnesota. So <laughs> um, I had a two-year degree in mechanical engineering, which was basically drafting. And the only person I knew down here was my brother. And I had taken some odd jobs. And I um, applied for this job that is, it, it was for a publishing company, it was for production artists, and I didn't even know what it was. And I thought, well, I'll never get this job. And, and the office manager calls me up, and she asked me to come in. And I, I, I go, great, I, I show up, I come in. I did not have a story to tell. She was helping me tell my story because she recognized that I had these mechanical skills, but I also had a little bit of art background. And being a production artist in, in an educational book publishing company is that you marry text and type with illustration and photography. It's like, wow, I have a transitional story. I didn't even know I had it, right? And so I you know, got hired, and I worked there for 24 and a half years. And um, it, was, it was an amazing experience. But when I found myself back here at Launchpad, I knew I could tell a transitional story, right? And it was a hard story. And I, I was talking to some other folks here today, the engineers, and you're talking about moving into a different realm, right? You were in semiconductor, and now you're moving into solar, right? Um, you have transitional stories, and today we'll talk about those. I have the, the pleasure to be working with Mark every day, and you can see the energy level that he brings, the excitement, and the solutions that we really try to help our clients with. And it's just, um, it's infectious. But I know what it's like to be in your chair, and you can kind of like get beaten down. I see uh, probably. 5,000 resumes a year with my talent strategy team. Uh, that's hundreds of interviews, hundreds of phone screens. So we're going to share with you today some of the things that we see that most job seekers miss out on. And, and Kathy, she's already given you guys some great experience, but we're going to kind of unpack that a little bit today. Good. Thank you, Scott. Uh, one more background that hopefully grounds why I could even be speaking to you, aside from being in your shoes is uh, over the years I have interviewed, read thousands of resumes, thousands of cover letters. I worked at a place one time with 26 recruiters and we were hiring 500 people a quarter. And I had 30,000 resumes in our database. And uh, I've, I've come up close with it and I've, I know it. And of course, at, at Liaison, uh, we have five to 10,000 people coming through our system a year. And uh, so that's, that's what I hope, I hope you can kind of say, well, we've seen what doesn't work. And we're hoping to recommend and propose some things that might work for you. So we're not experts. We've just done this a whole lot, right? Um, 
Experts call themselves experts. Uh, when you're a real expert, other people call you experts. That's just my thing. Does he get something for us? He, he does. He does. Give well, him one of those a, pens. A pen. Scott. A pen. Okay. All right. And he gets entered. That's really good. <laughs> I mean, that's a really good thing right there because even in one word expert there's a story right you can have one word story so that's good thank you what do you all think about this quote can everybody read it who would like to share any response to that <laughs> there is a difference. That's worth a pen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, back in the back. Sure. Um, I mean, what I interpret that to be is that it's, we can make it interesting. You know, it's always our interpretation of our own stories. And um, also in having a sense of where that fits in to yeah. a person's experience uh, is definitely a pretty Wow, very good. Make sure she gets in that drawing. That's great. Well, what I heard was that the, the main word I heard that I want to expound on is interpretation. That, that we all are artists. We can all make a creative attempt. Now, creativity sometimes gets stuck in a little thing that says, can you draw, can you paint, can you do music? It's not. It's not. Creative is creating. And you guys create every day. We all do. Now, some people are good at it and some people aren't. Some are intentional, some aren't. Some are aware, some aren't. But we are creating. I created a visual look today with this. I created that. I picked it out. I ironed it. I did everything. All you, did, that. you did pretty well. Thank you, yeah. Scott. Oh, love this guy. You had a question. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Yes, very yeah. good. She said that we tell stories to ourselves as well. Very good. Some of those are the most dangerous stories. That's what I was going to say. We get caught up on our own stories and we forget to share them and people then don't have an opportunity to give us a reality check if we don't share our right. story. So, man, very, very good. Thank you so much. Chris Denholm. <laughs> so, the context of my story, do I have one story and it's the story for everybody? Or is there a context where I tailor my story to who my audience might be? His question was, do you tailor your audience or do you have one primary story? And um, I would speculate, Chris, um, that we have probably a different story for every human we meet, for every situation. You know, a situation is a uh, collection of uh, threats, opportunities, or obligations. Most situations fit in that. In almost every situation, you're going to have a different story. If I yell fire right now, you're going to have a different story than if I yell, hey, more donuts showed up. <laughs> Right, because we're going to react because we have stories, and then we react to stories with our stories. I would say, yeah, definitely there are different stories. For example, I'm an engineer. I'm also a musician. So where I, where I am today as a musician is a completely different story. Yes. And, and there's very little intersection. Yes. And, you, and you guys are hitting on the heart of what we're really going to dive into today. So let's uh, one more, and then we'll get going. The first of the set on Yes, you could also call your story a business analyst. <laughs> you know, you could also call your story, your story also fits for sales. But then there's so that, that's a fundamental piece about, thank you for participating, there's a fundamental piece about how we take in information and then how we guide people, whether it's teaching uh, or band leading or software developing or, or whatever. We're taking in information and then we're putting out and adding value to the world. And that is the story. So let's get started here. Um, 
This is what, we're already accomplishing this, so this is awesome. Uh, we're going to heighten the awareness of the mechanisms and power of a story to land your next opportunity. And we're not sure how far we'll get. Um, we're going to get very far. We're yes. going to get very far, Scott said. Uh, <laughs> now, he, he's the most positive person. I was like, everyone from the Midwest is just so happy and positive. I'm like, wow. Uh, I just think they're angry inside. Uh, <laughs> The thing, the thing that really came up uh, as far as the subject and why we really wanted to be here today was because, like, like Mark said, I mean, even before I started at Liaison, I was looking at hundreds of resumes and, and stuff like that. And the, the biggest place where people are challenged is what, what Chris already identified there is, do I tell one story that fits all because I'll let someone figure it out for me, right? And I did that. That was my biggest mistake. Man, I had 24 and a half years and I crammed it into three pages and it's like, they're going to love me, right? And, 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 and I made them try to find my story. And, and I see that every day with the candidates that I work with. And that's what we really want to bring, with you, bring to you today is how to sort of start unpacking that. Great. <coughs> Raise your hand if you'd like to share what story are you in right now. We'll just take two or three of these. Keep it moving. Yes, please. I'm in the... Good. You're in a story that says, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. Man, knowing that you're in that story is awesome. I think she needs one of those bars. <laughs> that is awareness. Like the first step to everything is awareness. Yes. You know what you want to do, but you don't know how to find it. Okay. Good. Yes. Uh, I'm in a spot where you know, I just moved here from D.C quit my job and moved here because it's awesome. So I, I'm in that story of starting to live day for day for what it is and enjoy life instead of just working just to live. Great. Great. He said he moved here because he wanted to be here and he wants to live, not just work to live. So that's a great story to be in. One last one. But isn't this fun? Everybody has a story. Yes. Congratulations. So I am uh, starting like freshly out of uh, college at um, a little over 21 years of age. Yes. <laughs> she says she's slightly over 21 and just, <laughs> just starting her life after college, after a bachelor's degree. Well, congratulations. So what I, the point I want to make here is you notice that we're all in stories. What we want to be conscious of is what stories are we in that we're not speaking, all right? And what stories that maybe we're telling ourselves? And what stories are people telling about you? So are your friends saying the same story about you and you and you? So we're going to look at that, but I wanted to just locate us that we're always in a story. So what is a story? Um, you know, a story's more than just a message, right? It's a container, and we've already heard a bunch of great stories here today. It's a container that, that it can be multiple things that you have experienced over the years. It can be images that you paint for people to remember. That whole memorable aspect of your story is so important. Um, a story is something that you can connect with people on a universal level. There's so many universal themes out there. Many of you folks today are sharing that universal theme of like, this is where I've been, this is where I want to go. And um, it's something that will connect us forever. Um, a story also grounds you, right? It tells you that, you know, this is where I am, this is what I'm doing, and it puts parameters. It allows you to say, okay, if I don't have a story, that's okay, I already know that, but I know I need to be moving forward to help find that story. Another thing that a story does is it provides a sense of purpose for you, right? So even if you don't have a story, you know that you can go out and, and, and be at a networking event like this and help people define what could possibly be your story. Like someone helped me out. She helped me uh, define what my purpose was. And it also bridges the past uh, with the present. It can help you define where you want to go or where you don't want to go. Do you mind sharing what your purpose was? Yeah. <laughs> My purpose, I believe, is helping bring ideas to life, right? And I, I work with the creatives to help, um, 
take those abstract ideas and, and bring them into, in, into a way that people can understand them and use them to tell stories. Thank you. Kathy gets to enter. Yeah. <laughs> Why is a story important? Um, if you don't know your story, you can't adjust it for your audience. That's the one thing um, I see all the time. <clears throat> People come to me and they're looking for an opportunity. They go, well, Scott, what job should I apply for? It's like, hmm, you know, you don't really know what your audience is or that you have a story. And so if you don't have a story, you don't know how to adjust it. Like Chris was saying, you know, do I have one or two stories? Well, you have multiple stories and you adjust those very specifically for those audiences. Um, your stories, your history, and what sets you apart. You know, you bring a lot of, of experience, life experience, uh, job experience that you need to call on to help set you apart from other candidates. <clears throat> and it creates a connection. It creates a connection with you at the human level. <clears throat> Let me tell you a quick story. I was at work the other night. I was working late. Had another colleague that was where, there with me, and, and I had parked my car away, and I moved it closer to work because I wanted to, you know, be close. And I just disregarded all the the lines where the lines were in the parking lot. And he goes, "Hey, Scott, you just you don't really care about the parking lines, do you?" And I said, "No, I also do not like to color within lines." And he said, "Oh, that's funny." He goes, "When my wife was in third grade." she was asked to color a shape and then cut it out. And she colored way outside the lines, so when she cut the shape out, it created this beautiful, you know, edge-to-edge -edge color. And the teacher got mad at her because she colored outside the lines. Well, she went on to become an interior designer. So that little thing about coloring outside the lines triggered his story that he shared with me, so next time I meet his wife and talk with her, I'll have that commonality of coloring outside the lines. And her story is now told. Yeah, and her story is told, and she's a great uh, interior designer looking for work. So, <laughs> all right. So when you look at my story, this is your story. There are inputs to our story. What do you think some of those inputs are? Life experiences, very good. Make sure you get in that drawing. He's right here, Amy. Family. Family. Ooh, I love that one. Education. Can you keep up, Amy? Keep your hands up if you participated, because I want Amy to uh, make sure and put your name in there. Uh, man, who else? Work history. Dreams. Dreams. Oh, I love that one. That's from the entrepreneur in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, back in the back. Events, great. And you? I was going to say hills and valleys. Hills and valleys, wow. Disasters you've survived. Disasters, man. People who've helped you. People you've helped and hurt. People who have helped you and hurt you. Wow. Great, yes. Intent to create. Intent to create. Wow, these are good ones. We basically need to go rewrite our presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Missed opportunities. Chris. Mentors and leaders. Personal interests and affiliations. I hope you all are writing these down. We don't even have these, some of these down. I'm excited. I learned something today. Accomplishments and awards. Wow. Okay, so we're going to put up a short list. And some of these you'll see on here. But man, write all those down and share those with each other. Those were very, very good. Raise your hand if you didn't, if you volunteer, if you participated and didn't uh, get in the bin. Um, so these are ones that we set, and I'm not going to go over them. But uh, Mark, can I, can I talk to one real quick? Yeah. Yeah. I think the community aspect is really interesting. I end up talking with a lot of folks, and they tell me that they're doing volunteer work, and they're they're in, in these leadership roles within community volunteering. And they don't let that be part of their larger picture when they're looking for a new opportunity because they're actually doing more things um, in the community, developing their character, yes. where in the past they may have been in a role that didn't allow them to do that, but they forget to tell that part of their story. So um, I want to encourage you as you, communicate, or as you volunteer um, that those are really great opportunities to, to add to your story. Yeah, invest in your story by volunteering. It's great. Thank you, Scott. And then Scott's going to take the other half about the outputs. Any, any particular about outputs? What are the outputs of your story? How, how does your story get told? It can be a transitional phase. 
Well, okay, good. That's actually coming up a little differently, but how is your story expressed? LinkedIn. Yes. So by, uh, LinkedIn. LinkedIn. And a summary on LinkedIn is my story. Good. LinkedIn right here, Amy, on and this gentleman. Yes, sir? Um, by, by events or things that you've done. So if, if, if you started a company, you started a company, you know, you're going to have to manage the project. Great. Great. Projects, yes. Your resume, and cover resume and cover letter, big ones. <laughs> yes, you're telling stories here, right? Anytime you meet somebody for the first time. Anytime you meet somebody, yes. Personal website, portfolios, blogging, great. A what? A patent? Wow, yes. Well, so, Scott, why don't you reveal that? He had one right here. Uh, elevator pitch. Elevator pitch. Good. So, we've already collected even more of them. Raise your hand. <laughs> Raise your hand if you participated and uh, Amy didn't get you yet. Amy, you're going to get some exercise today. So, these are the vehicles for your story, right? These are where your story shows up. And the thing that's really interesting here is when you look at how often your story shows up in these different types of, of vehicles, it can be daunting. And, and one of the challenges that I had as a job seeker is that I let my resume be my only storytelling device. And I failed until I really stepped back and realized that, you know, it's the cover letter, it's your LinkedIn, it's your elevator pitch. I had an elevator pitch that I didn't change. I had one elevator pitch and then I realized I needed to change that elevator pitch based on my audience. But this is where I see so many candidates struggle, is they'll have a really great resume, but their cover letter will not unpack the things that I don't know about them. Or that their LinkedIn will not match their resume. Or that when they come and talk to me, they have this really amazing resume and cover letter, but they show up all puny, you know, and, and, and they don't have an energy level. And they come to shake my hand, and it's like, it's like, this, yeah, we creep you know, out about that and, at the office. And here's what happens. If, if, if you do that at Liaison and Mark shakes your hand and you come up like this. Yeah, I'll take, I'll, Mark, he, we'll have do, a tutorial Mark? What do you do at the office. You do the tutorial, you go, do that, give that to me again, right? Yeah. But that's what he does. Yeah, so what are you trying to, what story are you trying to tell with your handshake? <laughs> uh, you can be too strong, too weak, too soft, too, you know, where is your eye contact? What story are you telling about yourself? It happens everywhere. And I think the key is not to get overwhelmed with the number of places that you have to tell your story. We're going to talk about how to craft your story, but once you get your story, know that it's going to show up in all these places. I'm not a social networking expert, right? And Twitter and some of those things scare me, but you know, those are things you have to invest in because that's where people are posting and reviewing. So know that you have to customize and modify, and it's okay. And you don't have to do it overnight, but just know that there's a journey in getting your story and all those delivery mechanisms. So we're going to talk a little bit about the components of a story. I really want to give credit to this, this audible uh, book that I've been listening to. It's called um, uh, Storytelling for Professionals and um, Families. I guess a family is a good thing to tell a story to. And the name of the individual, she's a, she's a doctor, and it's um, Hannah Harvey. And we're going to have this presentation available, and we'll have that contact in there. But I was telling a story of an umbrella, of how things fit with an umbrella. And she does a really great job of talking about how things fit together in a triangle when it comes to storytelling. And these things will be pretty obvious to you when we start revealing them. But these things are dynamic, right? These are, these are things that need to, um, to be changed based on your story. But anyway, so the first thing in the story here is the narrator. It's you, right? You're the person who's telling the story. You're the one who has the relationship with the story and with the audience. The second thing that you have to have here is an audience, right? And, and right here we have an audience. You might have an audience in an elevator. You might have an audience with your family. And the third part, obviously, is the story. And these three components that make up the story uh, create a connection. They cannot be without each other. You can't um, be telling a story to nobody. You, well, you can tell it to yourself, but they may not be that effective. You know what that feels like, right, when you're telling a story and no one's listening? Yeah. yeah. It's like my life every night at dinner with my family. <laughs> yeah, they're texting. texting yeah. And so 
You can't. I mean, unless you actually have someone leaning in on your story, <laughs> this, this triangle won't work. Then nothing will happen. And then if they're le if they're leaning in and you don't have a story, uh, that's not going to work because we walk away from those people or we start texting or we go find a better story. And if you aren't there, meaning out in the world, really working on your stories and really talking to your stories, and if you aren't speaking it and writing it and expressing it, it won't be there either. Like these three things have to be there. But what you do have a choice of is how, how you connect these things, right? So you have choices of who your audience will be. You have a choice of what story you're going to tell. I have people tell me the wrong story all the time. They tell me a story of being a victim, they got laid off, and they just need benefits. Well, the story I need to hear is how you're going to bring your great experience and, and life skills to help our client out who has a lot of different challenges that they need to have resolved in their workspace. And let me add to that right there. I wouldn't call it a wrong story, Scott. May I? Go ahead, Mark. Uh, I would call it a irrelevant. There's a relevance factor. That's so true. there right. is a story that could be relevant to say, man, I got laid off. I need benefits. I need a job. Like that story might be with your spouse or with your counselor or with someone like Kathy or a coach. You know, there's a place for that story. There's an absolute place yeah. for that story. So there's not really a right or wrong story, but boy, do the stories not relate to our business problems every day. I right. think that's the big point. Absolutely. And it's, yeah. that, it's that choice. It's the choice of what story you're going to tell to that audience. And um, it, it can change. You yeah, can, You can be should. telling a story, and you know what? People do tell me a story after they can convince me, or not necessarily convince me, but share with me the larger picture. And it's like, yeah. I'm really at a place where I need to take care of my family, you know, and they bring in that human connection. We talked about that human connection earlier in the story. I'm a human. I want to help them out. Sure. I'd love to give everybody a job. Sure. So let's talk about just the key components real quick. Um, so as a narrator, we kind of covered this. What story are you telling? Are you picking up clues um, as you're telling the story so that you can adjust your story? We had an interview yesterday come by and Scott was trying to give as big a clues as possible I mean he was like you know I want to talk I mean you know and they just were not picking up clues right you know just like to, to your listener right they don't care I mean let's just talk about that for a minute nobody cares unless they care and if you think about it it's true for all of us like do any of you care right now that uh, really care that I pulled out of my driveway yesterday and broke part of my mirror on my car. <laughs> now you might care, Chris says he cares. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know, and I prove that because you're not coming up and giving me money to fix it. You're not saying, hey, I'm a mechanic, I'll fix it for free. That's how you know if someone cares if they take action with you. There you go, Chris. Right? You and it's not an emotional thing and it's not a moral thing about whether people care or not. But, it, but you do, you, you, you gotta you got assume people don't care. What they're really caring about is their mirror, their company, their job, their family, and that's what we all do. So, you know, I just wanted to lift that up, that uh, don't assume people should care. They're only going to care when it has something to do with what they care about. And that's what we're going to talk about. Yep. And you saw earlier today, Mark checked the pacing, right? He checked the pacing of the presentation. When you're chatting with someone on the phone or interview, see what the pacing is. If the, if the person is really hurried and, and talking fast, kind of mimic that and move along with them. If you're going to talk really slow and tell a long story, it's just not going to happen for you. Um, we already talked about energy uh, and enthusiasm. You know, where's your story coming from? How are you presenting it? Um, and then are you leaving a little bit of mystery and Ooh. intrigue in your story, right? Yes. Uh, you've got you've to have a little hook there yes. to get people to pay attention, right? You do. So. If you don't, it's, I mean, you watch any shows on TV without a little bit of intrigue. Okay, are we just going to get real? Who watches the Kardashians? <laughs> you know? Uh, who watches the Pawn Shop show? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I will. I will. So all you have to do is watch TV or a commercial. Any commercial will do. Any movie trailer will do. You notice how you respond to movie trailers? They get you leaning in. Anyone read Hardy Boys or Nancy Drew growing up? Did it not 
force you to go to the next chapter to get the resolution. So, so you can follow cues in our society because it's all about that mystery. Now, you don't want to walk up to Scott and go, Whoa. Guess what I do? <laughs> <laughs> like, don't do that. Um, <laughs> or, or, yeah, or why you don't have a job. But, but stories unfold. And if you notice the best stories you've ever heard, they unfold. And hang on one second, I'll get you. Um, and so the part of the mystery is letting it unfold, letting your audience lean in a little, right? So being patient. What we tend to do is walk up and go, hey, this is why I'm so good. This is why I'm qualified for your job. Oh, my gosh, I'm so excited. And you're in their face, and they're just like, there's no intrigue. And have you ever had a date like that? <laughs> <laughs> you can pattern your question after how do you behave on that first or second or third date. You leave a little mystery. You don't tell them you got six kids. You know? <laughs> so you see what I'm saying? It's like, let the story reveal in its appropriate time is the best way I can answer that. You had a question? Yes. I was going to say... Oh, I'm sorry. That the 10 o'clock news tends to do that. I'm trying to... Tends to do it? That's all it is. <laughs> I'm trying to go to bed at like 10 o'clock and at 9.30 they say... Yes. You know what they call that in TV? Teaser. So you can pattern. You just watch the stories that you're attracted to. You can do that. I worked in TV. We did teasers all the time back then. Just like that, like hanging, hanging on. Everybody does it. The weather is the worst. Yeah. Yeah. Is it going to rain tomorrow? <laughs> yep. Tune in. Yes. <laughs> just tell me if it's going to rain. So, I mean, and it's getting crazier because all the information. Um, Let's go to story real quick, because, gosh, I'm going to get to my section and just fly. So, uh, the story that you're telling, right? The, the, I was telling a story of I needed a new day, right, when, when I left after 24 and a half years. And so I took my transitional story um, that I wanted to apply all my creative skills, and I'd worked with National Geographic School Publishing as a consultant. I wanted to take all, I worked at Dell for a couple years with industrial designers. I wanted to take all that stuff and bring it to liaison resources because I knew how to look at really great people and identify opportunities. So I had a new story to tell, right? And you might have just moved here, right? Yeah. And you've got a great, and you're already kind of level with your story, which is awesome, right? So you know, knowing what story you're in is really important. Are you making a lateral move within an industry, right? Are you just moving from one type of company, one semiconductor, to another semiconductor, um, telling that story? Um, are you in a transition story? Maybe you've been out of the workforce for a while. Maybe you were taking care of a family, someone who was sick, or, or you just haven't had a job, and then you took some time off, which is great. I love it when people tell me that they took time off to be with their family and get refreshed because they come back with um, a whole new level of excitement. Oh, yeah. yeah. Don't ever think being out of the workforce uh, will keep you from it. Your story will keep you from it about being out of the workforce, but being out of the workforce will not keep right. you from it. And then there's the advancement story, ready to move on. Maybe you've hit a glass ceiling. Um, you can't advance. The company isn't large enough, and you want to move forward. Yeah. Um, and then there's sort of the dream story, right? This is something that's completely outside of anything you've ever done before, but maybe you're really good at something. Maybe you've got a hobby or a craft or something that you really want to turn that into an opportunity. So each one of these stories um, has a different way to tell it and has a different way to present them. Great. Now we've done two pieces of the triangle. We're going to the third, right, Scott? Mm -hmm. We've done okay. all three. Well, yeah, I've got the audience. Yep. The important part. Um, the audience, who are they? Are they decision makers? Are you sitting there talking with the receptionist at the front desk, which is really important? Is she an influencer? He an influencer? Absolutely. Um, what do they know about you? I was, in, I was trying to think that people would figure out what I'm about by looking at my resume, but that's not true. They need to also talk with me. So basically, what are your skills and expertise? What might people imply about you? Um, what interests them, right? You walk into an office, you've heard this before, you see a Baylor Bears sticker up on their window. Hey, you're, you're gonna, sick yeah. of bears! <laughs> you're going to talk a little bit about the bears. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. I didn't I, see that I coming. Know, I know. But we're trained at Baylor to do that. I know. It gets you yeah. excited. So. I love that. Okay. See, I, I had a human connection there with Mark. Wow. <laughs> that surprised me. What interests them? 
You know, are you there talking with a director who's really more interested in a big picture story? <clears throat> or are you there talking with a manager who really wants to know more details about what your skills are? And then what setting are you in? What kind of distractions are there? And how much time do they have? <clears throat> I was talking with a guy the other day. I called him up for a phone screen. I always ask, is this a good time to talk? Because I don't want to distract you. If you're driving, I want you to be safe. The guy's like, no, I'm fine. He's walking down the street. I'm hearing sirens and horns, and I'm hearing shuffling and everything. It wasn't a productive conversation. So you always have to think about, you know, he did not think about the audience. And the audience at that point was me, and that sometimes it, it is all about me because I was looking for an opportunity to provide him, and it just didn't work yeah. out. So. And uh, back to the audience, um, I landed uh, my first sales job. Uh, I'd never had sales experience before. And I wrote this cover letter, and it started with, when I was a little kid, comma. Is that some good mystery for you? And I talked about this, and it connected to what they were looking for. But I told a story about when I was eight years old, and I, it was a paragraph or two story, and I was hired, and later, a month later, I went by this administra uh, uh, um, admin desk and she said, hey, I loved your story. She was screening the resumes and she circled it and said, hire him. Wow. And she handed it to the president of the company. It works. And you guys all have these stories. You were all little kids. You were teenagers, you were mothers, your fathers, your, you know, so you have the stories. Just don't discount them. That will trigger people. <laughs> but, right? yeah, but also get to the point, because I get those cover letters where someone starts out. I was inspired when I was in third grade. Yeah, some people start with the lava covered the earth, and, <laughs> you know. That doesn't work so well unless you're in volcanology or something, you know. So, Mark, when you wrote that story, was it a true story, or were you embellishing to get that specific job or something? That was a really good question. Uh, what I did, no, it's a great question. Well, I mean, I just like want to know, we are talking about creativity here, right? Yeah. A story is your story. You choose uh, what's going to go in that story, if you're going to bend it, whatever. That's not for me to say. That story wouldn't have been more true. My dad read that story and he goes, I remember that day. Wow. Yeah. Because I jacked up his business is what happened. <laughs> I did. I messed up my dad's ability to earn money that day. And he, so he remembered it. <laughs> uh. Now you have to tell us. What did you think? Mm. Yeah. I wish we had time, but I'll, I'll, I'll figure that out. Um, uh, anyone bring a job description or get one from us? Will you hold it up? Oh, keep holding them up. You got your job description? Yeah. Because I'm getting some, you know, work in your carpal tunnel, all that. <laughs> so keep holding it up. What is it you, do you have in your hand? Piece of paper. An employment opportunity. Employment opportunity. A, a, Chris? A cry for help. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give him a hand. Yeah. So we, we need to reveal that we've worked with Chris before. So, yeah. Yeah. So he's not... Yeah. Well, I, you know, Chris, can I tell him? Chris was one of my clients for, since 2008. Isn't that awesome? You know, like it all goes around, you know? So, now, you know, bosses, clients, people, it all goes around. But that is exactly right, Chris. It's a business crying out for help. And let me tell you, has anyone in here ever posted a job when you've worked somewhere and you needed somebody? Was it kind of a hassle? Yeah. You got to write it, you got to get it approved, you got to wonder if it's right. You put it out there, and then what happens? The worst thing ever, all these people need a job. And you, can't, you can only give it to one. And you've got all these hundreds of resumes, and you're like, oh my gosh. And then your brand starts suffering because you're not getting back with them, or your company's not getting back with them. So there's two or 300 people that are like, they don't care about anybody. And then guess what? Then you've got to train them and hire them, and then there's a 50% chance it'll work out. Nobody in their right mind hires anybody. <laughs> you only do it because you have this crazy opportunity coming. The business is going to be growing. Or the competitor just did something, and the company has to respond to it. 
or someone just quit and someone's working 80 hours a week because someone just quit they're crying for help their family's suffering you know the, the admins are suffering everybody is not doing well when you see that job description they're not or they're super excited about something and they need help now can, do, do y'all get that now that's really important let's go on Anyone do this in sixth grade, Plop Mountain, English? Okay, so this is a simple, oh, I'm so excited right now. <laughs> this is my favorite thing to do in the whole world. Um, you can apply this to any movie, any book, any commercial, especially if it's something like, you know, a drug commercial, prescription drug commercials, car commercials. You can apply it to everything. This plot mountain, this starts right here with the conflict. And guess what you were holding? Business is in a conflict. They're growing, they're shrinking, someone's quitting, their morale's bad. I mean, something's going wrong and they need help. That's the whole crux of this. If you don't know all your stories, and if you don't inventory all your stories, and if you don't take the time to tailor them to that conflict, it's not going to matter. Scott's just going to look at you and going, I don't have time to fix your story. Because, you know, there's just too much going on. You guys can outcompete everybody else in the market today if you will just look at the jobs you're applying for and identify the conflict. And, and you can make up it too, right? They're making it up. Everyone's making it up. But if you look at that description and it says, what's, what, where's the job description? What's one of them? What's the title of it? Sales director, what do you think's wrong over there? <laughs> <laughs> Something very wrong is going on at that company. Sales are not getting done. The sales director left. They don't have a sales director. Sales are down. If it's a public company, their shareholders going down. If it's a private company, some investors are yelling. The CEO's, you know, yelling at his kids. It is bad over there without a sales director. <laughs> so, and you get in that framework, and you go, oh, I'm a problem solver. I'm not a job applicant. Really, I would love it if one thing you guys did is erase the word job applicant from your brain. <laughs> you know, this pen might work. I'll try like they do on, you know, Men in Black. Um, <laughs> and just think you're a problem solver, okay? Here's the next exciting part. Rising action. Every movie, every commercial, every trailer, the news. They all do it because you know why? The human experience responds to it. Our biology responds to it. How many times have you stopped and you just go, wow, that's a good story, and you cannot look away? I think that's why reality TV has done what it's done because it's just like, wow, there's conflict, and they know when to cut it off before the commercials, and then they, the commercials are the same thing. We're going to go over what rising action you can be in to resolve the business conflict. You're, we're going to go over what you think you can do to resolve that sales role. Is there another one? Who else had one? That, yes? The director of food and nutrition? <laughs> wow. Um, what, com what company or is it organization? Oh, good. It's at a nursing home or a senior living place. Wow. Uh, there is nothing to do at senior living places except bingo and eat, okay? <laughs> That's a problem if the food's not working. And lots of drug interactions with certain foods, lots of digestive issues. I have very good friends that are nursing homes, and food is huge. So we have end users that are in conflict. We have management. We have people that are not paying $6,000 a month with, for their parents to be in there because the food's terrible. I mean, they have regulations from the government, and I mean, terrible things happen if that doesn't get fixed. And what we're going to talk about is the resolution, get it? Now, falling action, if this was a movie, I would say, hey, here's a guy, his wife left him, really good guy though, but she left him for something, and then the rising action is all these little plot points. In your life, they're all the jobs, they're all the people, they're all the things we'll go over in a minute. But it rises to the resolution, right? And you know, in the love story, he meets somebody, right? And she doesn't take him seriously because he doesn't have a job, or maybe because um, the mirror's broken on his car. The mirror's broken on his car. Who would date that guy? 
Um, but there's something that, you know, and then, they, then there's all this tension. And then he meets her daughter. And all of a sudden, he gets along with her daughter. And there's a plot point. And it starts rising up, right? Every story, including yours, including business, is all rising action to the resolution. Falling action is that stuff that happens after they get together, after those people get together. It's a lot of stuff that prepares for the next story or the sequel, right? Can you guys ever watch a movie and you go, man, that's sequel stuff right there? I mean, you go, oh, they're heading us to a sequel. Well, every story has it because this next story is your possibility because your story is not going to be over when you get that job. It's just beginning. There's going to be tons of stories, right? Scott, let's run through that. Sure. Uh, one of my talent strategists that I work with, I asked him the other day, he's been doing this for 10 years, I said, uh, Sam, how many uh, individuals properly address the business conflict uh, with a cover letter or resume? And he said 2 to 5%. He's and been with us seven yeah. years, probably yeah. seen, oh my gosh, right. 20,000 resumes, 2%. Yes? 2% of people address the business conflict in the resume or cover letter. At our company. Right. Or, or attempt to try to figure out what it is. Sometimes it's not obvious, but your attempt to, to reveal that is really important. So one of the things on the rising action, uh, obviously, is to do research on the company. You know, go to Glassdoor. Glassdoor is a really great place to see news about a company and to, to get information about salaries and, and to see what people are saying about the organization. You'll see where there's conflict within the organization. So do your research. Craft your story to fit that business conflict. You know, earlier today with Chris, it's like craft that story so it is so specific to that business need, they can't put that resume down or that cover letter. Remember all those outputs we talked about to your story? All that gets crafted to the business need. LinkedIn's a little hard because it's got to stay kind of generic, right. but your elevators pit, pitch, your friendships, your relationships, your lunches, everything has to start targeting that conflict and all the people you talk to and every way that your story gets expressed resume cover letters thank you notes all of it if it's not organized around the conflict there's little chance uh you're gonna get right well i'll tell you you can still get hired and stuff but you're making it really hard on them and you've got competitors that are doing it better so all you got to do to beat all those people out there, 98% of them. You guys want to do that? Just beat 98% of them in one thing. Organize your thinking around the business problem. You've got a problem too. You've got to feed your families and all that kind of stuff. That's important, but that's a different story. It's not their problem either. No, right. it's not their problem. they got problems. We're here to solve problems. We're not here to apply for jobs. Okay, so have your story of conflict, but it's got to match their story at some point, what you've got to offer. Practice telling your story, right? Get comfortable in, in not only your elevator pitch, but what you're trying to share with individuals. Because sometimes it may not come across because you have this tribal knowledge of what you've done in the past, and you may have all these things that you're implying that, that Mark may not understand, right? You may be using acronyms that are from an industry no one cares about. I have people do acro spew all the time. It's acronym <laughs> spewing at me. It's like, I have no idea what you just told me, right? Yeah. And they're trying to work themselves into a transitional job, but I don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. So, so practice. Um, adjust your story. Get out there and network. Uh, present your story, which is basically applying for that opportunity. You go through the interview, which is basically telling your story. So this is a movie right here. The conflict. The rising action are all those scenes. In a regular movie, it's stuff like people beating each other up and shooting each other and kissing and making babies and you know saving the world and you know Bruce Willis is on a meteor somewhere. <laughs> you know, like that's all happening. But this is you. You can use it. Like look around you every day. Every trailer you see from now on, watch the conflict, rising action, and what they'll do on the trailer in the movies is they'll stop just short of the resolution. So you'll go pay 10 bucks to go to the movie. Right? That's mystery. Now, are y'all with me or am I crazy? <laughs> okay, good. Thank you, because I, I think a little of both. Let's go real quick, because we're almost out of time. Uh, the one last thing, too, is after the interview, um, really follow up. I know I'm surprised how few people and not that I need to be recognized by any means, but very few people 
will send an email or or even a card, a card, right? I mean, that handwritten thing really separates you from the digital world these days, right? And it's not because I need that, but it means that you care and you're thoughtful. And if you're caring and thoughtful, guess what? You're probably going to be a good team. Yes, member. the talent strategy team brings everybody that gets interviews over to us and meets the owner and meets me. Hundreds and hundreds of people I've met pop out of my office, I talk to them, I kind of figure out, try to explain the business conflict so they can help explain how they could solve it and that kind of stuff. In 10 years, well over a thousand people have walked in by my door, well over. And I've gotten three handwritten thank you notes and maybe 10 emails that said, wow, great to meet you. Thanks for telling me a little bit more about the problem that I could help solve. So you guys can beat 98% of the market if you just do that. So the, the falling action is about now, now you get hired and oh, guess what? You've got to solve their problem. That's the nerve wracking part, not getting a job. Uh, and so you're sol you're, the falling action in the love story is when they kind of they go ahead and get married. You know that little marriage scene that happens at the very end and they kind of walk up in the sunset or, or they have a twinkle because they just got pregnant and it sets up this thing. Or if Bruce Willis is on a meteor, all of a sudden he fixes that, but there's a, the falling action. They realize, oh my God, there's another meteor out there. All this kind of stuff right here. And Scott, keep going. But you're solving business problems. You're expanding your skills inside that new organization. You're looking for more conflicts to solve. Hey, this is how to get a job. You got to keep a job. Look for more conflicts. Any any you can find in the office, like fix them, right? Help with them, contribute, and then network, get involved, and innovate. And that's what sets this up because everyone's going to start coming to you in the office to solve their problems, and then all your stories start happening again, and your career story is going on top of this because this is just a story about getting a job and solving a problem. Your career story is all these kind of stories on this rising action. See how it nests? It gets nutty in here. Okay. Any questions about that real quick? Because we're going to wrap up. You'll get all this. Kathy's going to provide it. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, good. Let's go to the next one, Scott. Uh, workshop, we have time. Okay, so we're not going to be able to workshop today, but we just want to, we're going to leave uh, this, and you can do this at home. You can do this after your next Launchpad Job Club meeting. You can do it, but there's three little workshops that we're going to put up there. Go ahead and build them. And one of them is take a job description and circle words that indicate conflict. Uh, and speculate where there's a business problem and then talk about it with somebody, your spouse, your kids, anyone who will listen, share where you think the business conflict is. And uh, the next one is a cover letter. You have an example with you. How does your cover letter address their problem or not? Or does it just talk about you and how perfect you are, right? But talk about the problem. Make notes on how you could adjust the story. And then guess what? Talk about it with people because they'll help you. And then third one, is what your resume, look at it and go, what business problem does my resume address? Is it super clear? Is it in a summary? If they read it for 30 to 40 seconds, which that's what they do, I watch 26 recruiters do it, it goes in the trash or it stays on their desk for a little while longer. Those are the two options. One of them goes. So share it with the group and figure out if your resume goes, after 30 seconds, do I see clearly what this guy or woman can do and solve. Let's go on, Scott. So that's, that'll be up on the slides, and you can do that on your own. What to do next, Scott? Uh, commit to a time frame. I know this is all probably overwhelming, and you have a lot of things to do, but <clears throat> commit to a time frame to go look at your story, your resume, your LinkedIn profile, um, how you're presenting yourself. Um, Fix the easy stuff now, right? The consistency between your resume and your cover letter and LinkedIn. Stuff that's really easy to fix. Um, create your story. Test your narrative. Don't be shy. I'm an introvert. I have a hard time testing my story, but you've got to go out and do it. And then find the business problems, and that's going to be your plot mountain. So, what's that? Yes. Question from Amy, everybody. Um, I, my question is, um, we, you covered the cover letter, and I've heard two sides. Uh, one is nobody reads cover letters, and the other side is that 
recruiters don't read cover letters, but hiring managers do. I understood what you said about 2% of the people addressing the problem in the cover letter, but where do you come down on the whole thing of they get read or they don't? Uh, I'll answer this in a particular okay. way. It's going to be super classy, too. <laughs> They may not read it, but if they do, it better not suck. <laughs> yes. You are increasing your chances by writing a cover letter because this is the same stuff that you're going to uh, blog about. This is the same stuff that you're going to tell your friends about. It's the story of why you should go over, like, you have friends that work in some companies that you want to work in. That cover letter story is one that you could just, like, copy and paste and send to them because it's a good story and it'll trigger them. So now I read cover letters like crazy because if they don't care for a cover letter, like Scott, same thing. Yeah, I mean the cover letter shows that you care and you're taking the time to figure it out. <clears throat> and if you <clears throat> really nail it, I'm going to read the resume. Now the challenge is your resume often gets separated from a cover letter and people's resumes don't carry a story. Yeah. I was with a major high tech client yesterday and I said, do you read cover letters? They go, no, we take them, we throw them away and we look at the resume. I go, what if the story's not there? Well, guess what? They don't talk to you. Yeah. So you have to have those skills and that story built in. Executive summaries are great. I see so many people right at the top. Uh, my objective is to get a job <clears throat> and work with a cross-functional team and be really good at what I do. It's like, well, great. That's what everybody who walks in the door wants to man, do. Right? Use that summary for use your story. Use that top third of your page, man. Talk about And the make sure the conflict yeah. is in there. Right. Yep. So thank you, Kathy, for letting us be here. Thank, thank, you thank you all much. of you. Thank you very much. Good luck with your stories. Keep on keeping on. Tell your story, tell it from your heart, take the time, it's gonna work out. All right, thank you guys.